Um, okay, we'll get started. So uh, welcome everybody and a happy new year and um, hope this is a start of something good this year. Um, most of you know who I am. Uh, I'm Kevin Rogers, I'm Director of Reasonable Faith and tonight I'm going to talk on, give an overview of New Testament textual criticism and consider the question, um, how well do we really know uh, the, what the original authors said in the Greek? So the uh, first slide, whoops, I didn't mean that, sorry. Just go back. That picture there uh, is uh, uh, the earliest known uh, fragment of the New Testament. It's called um, B52. You've got a black letter B there and the number 52. And it's uh, uh, parts of John chapter 18, both on uh, one side and the other. And it, uh, it's usually dated to around about 125 AD, which is uh, round about supposedly um, within 30 years of when the original document was written. So that's our earliest fragment. So it's not very big. Um, and um, the um, New Testament papyri are uh, given a, a sequence of numbers with the black letter B. So they go from B1 up to around about B130 odd. But very hard to write the black letter B, so we often use P. <laughs> so this is often called P52. Anyway, we'll get on with the uh, next slide. So what is textual criticism? Textual criticism is a critical analysis of uh, multiple manuscripts, um, Greek and in other languages. And the aim of it is to obtain a Greek text of the New Testament that is as close as possible to the original archetypes. So I'll explain what an archetype is later. So when the Gospels were originally published, uh, we have to um, ask the question, what does publication actually mean to them in those days? Because uh, when we say um, we're going to publish something, usually we, ref we refer to the written word. But for them it meant both oral and written, uh, because at the time there were fairly low levels of literacy, and so written books were meant for public reading and for the... Uh, New Testament documents are meant for public reading in churches. So you had those who could read, who'd read them out for those who didn't have direct access to it. So uh, each church had copies of various New Testament books and those church uh, copies became warned that uh, typically be replaced every 25 years. So um, every 25 years someone would do the work of copying. So how did they actually do publishing? Well, we don't have any of the New Testament originals, so we don't have any direct evidence. So um, our understanding is based on examination of other documents that are not in the New Testament where we do have <laughs> copies. And so it is assumed that the New Testament uh, manuscripts would have been published in a similar method. So. Uh, commonly, but not always, it was a two-stage pro, um, process. So initially there was an autograph and then, uh, then an archetype. So the autograph was a draft and the archetype was a template for people to copy for production. So the autograph was often dictated to an amenu, amanuensis. Um, so that's just uh, somebody who wrote it down. And um, in modern day terms, they're called a ghost writer. And then the, what the amenuators uh, wrote down would be annotated by the author to make corrections. Um, then the, um, the corrections were included into the archetype. They were signed off by the author and distributed. So what were the archetypes like? Um, so this is basically just an educated guess because we don't have any, uh, but it's based on the practices of the time. So they vary in quality. Um, some of the manuscripts that we've got um, still retain grammatical errors. So the grammatical errors were not corrected in, during the copying process, which is uh, probably an indication of reliability. 
Um, they, expected, uh, ex um, they expect that the originals had shorter endings and believe that some of the doxologies at the end of the letter uh, were added later. The Gospels would not have had titles or author identification, but it's generally considered that the, the archety uh, archetypes would have been a polished work. Stages of publication. Initially, all the New Testament books were just uh, distributed as single copies. Um, and later on in the end of the first century uh, and beginning of the second, um, there were collections formed. It's um, believed that uh, Paul's letters were the initially collected together and distributed as a, a group. And then the Gospels, four Gospels were distributed. And uh, we have to wait until the 300 uh, onwards before we had collections into virtually complete New Testaments. And it wasn't until around about 400 that the canon was formally established. So uh, identifying exactly which books would be included in the, the canon. To get an idea of um, what the situation was like uh, during the um, early years, um, Luke's prologue um, gives us a bit of insight. This is Luke 1, 1 to 4. It's quite wordy, so I'll read it out. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. That's from the NIV. In the Greek, this is one long sentence. The NIV is divided up into two, but it's still pretty wordy. So I, th I think the average reader who would read that would think, oh, that's a bit heavy. Let's get on to the story. <laughs> um, but, so, but we're going to break it up into parts. So um, the first two verses about the witnesses and the writers. Um, many have uh, undertaken to draw up. Now, I've just started learning Greek. Uh, not very good at it. No, enough to be dangerous. So I thought I'd do a bit of showing off. All right. So the word for um, uh, draw up is um, this long word here, and I've um, put in dashes to hyphenate it into sil syllables. So that's alpha, new alpha, uh, tau, alpha, sigma, sigma, omicron, um, mu, alpha, iota. So it's, uh, say, so ar, na, tas, soth, mai, anatosamai. So that means to arrange or compose. And then an account, and I won't bother going through spelling that out, um, but that uh, can mean, a, um, at its highest level, can mean a thorough historical nav narrative. So compose or to write a uh, historical nav narrative. Of the things that have been fulfilled among, among us, the word just as is uh, interesting because it is carthos. Uh, so it means corresponding to, exactly as. Uh, they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So looking at the first thing that's described happened second. <laughs> so the thing that happened uh, first um, was the oral handing down by the eyewitnesses. Um, so it says, just as they were handed down to us. So that was the first bit. Handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So subsequently, others compiled written narratives to accurately reflect the oral tradition that was handed down by the eyewitnesses. So that makes sense? Another aspect of this was that in right composing a narrative, what was Luke trying to do? Luke was more interested in recording what Jesus did and, did and said rather than in writing a biography. 
because uh, in Acts 1 1 he says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. So he's interested in what Jesus did and taught. So this was consistent with the style of Hellenistic biographies at the time. Luke's role. Um, verse 3 says, With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account. Um, Luke made use of oral sources and other written accounts. Uh, we can tell this from uh, just looking at the text of Luke. Um, Luke, um, both Matthew and uh, Mark make use, sorry, Matthew and Luke make use of Mark. So uh, Matthew copies around about 80% uh, of Mark's text and Luke copies around about 50% of it. So he was true to his word <laughs> uh, that he actually consulted written accounts. There's also material that, uh, in both Matthew and Luke that is common but is not in Mark. So scholars presuppose there was another document which they call Q or Quell, which means source, uh, that was a common source for both Matthew and Luke. We, uh, the document has never been discovered. There's debate over that. And also Luke has his own unique material, which is imaginatively called L for Luke. <laughs> According to Acts, if you follow the we passages, Luke was in Jerusalem between 57 and 59 AD while Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea. So that would have been a great opportunity for him to actually consult eyewitnesses in Jerusalem. Um, and um, the book I consulted a lot on, a lot on this was uh, Encountering the Ma Manuscripts by Philip Comfort, who's a, a top textual critic. And he summarised it this way, the written word in Luke's gospel was the inscri inscribed replication of the oral proclamation. Now Theophilus, uh, verses three and four uh, go on to say, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. <coughs> and the word for taught is Katakeo might sound familiar. Kate means exactly. Ekeo means to sound, to sound exactly. Katakeo is a lexical form from which we get catechism. It means to teach by word of mouth through repetition. So you'd have repeatedly said it and you'd recite it back. So um, the written narrative was to confirm what Theophilus had already le uh, learned through catechism from, by memorising the oral tradition. Now I'm going to talk about manuscript categories. Not all of them are the same standard. At the top level, you, um, so we've got four uh, categories that scholars refer to. So they're professional or bookhand, reform documentary, documentary and common. Professional book hand, uh, the examples of uh, manuscripts P75 and Codex Vaticanus, we'll talk about them later. So this was uh, done by a professional scribed in a scriptorium in the library uh, by a professional. Um, they are written slowly, carefully, uh, they are highly accurate and they are a work of art. Um, the next level down is called Reform doc, um, Documentary. This is also by professional scribes who uh, were accustomed to writing legal documents and correspondence. So they are business scribes. So they wrote quicker, they were making money, and uh, they used abbreviations and they were usually paid for their work. So you'd get, you'd get the um, professional scribe in the script, scriptorium doing his careful, slow work, and then when he uh, wanted to make some more money, you could go and do some business correspondence and uh, do that as well and use a different style. Then there's a third layer which is called documentary. Uh, this was done by business and minor officials like church members or uh, lectors, so an educated layman. Um, and this constitutes nearly half of all the papyri. Um, and then there's a, a category called common that's uh, done by people barely able to read, read Greek. 
and examples of P9 and P10. So common is a nice way of saying complete rubbish. So um, there is actually uh, far more weight given, uh, textual critics consider the top level far more seriously than the bottom. So not all manuscripts are the same. New Testament papyri. Uh, these uh, a group of documents are the earliest witness to the original text of the New Testament. Uh, the numbering system was introduced by Caspar uh, René Gregory, who died in 1917. And as explained before, he used the black letter B, but P is commonly used, e.g. P52. The number indicates the order of registration, not the date. So this is the order in which they are registered in the list. Um, in 1900, nine were known. In 1963, 76 were known. In 2015, 131 were known. And if you want to see a, a complete list of these and get references to them, they're on Wikipedia. <laughs> so all you have to do is Google list of New Testament manuscripts and it will take you there. Writing materials. Um, the original manuscripts were written on papyrus. Uh, on the right, the, uh, there is a picture of a papyrus plant. Uh, papyrus was invented by the Egyptians around about 2,000 years earlier. Um, and um, later on, they used parchment, so that's the bottom right. So that was just animal hide. And there's also references to vellum. So vellum's just super parchment. Um, so they only use um, the hide from a calf and they treated it uh, in special ways. It was a higher quality and more expensive. Writing forms. Uh, in New Testament times, it was common to use a scroll, which uh, you'd be familiar with, as you see. So um, it's rolled up on both sides. Uh, the scroll was only written on one side. Um, to do temporary recording, so they could use a wax tablet. So this was just a wooden board with uh, wax on it, and people would use a stylus to scratch the text um, into the uh, wax. And um, it was meant to be temporary and reusable, so it's for making quick notes. And then when you finish with it, you uh, heated the wax and you could start again. Um, also, uh, towards the end of the first century, uh, I don't know who invented it, it's probably the Romans, but they invented the codex. Uh, so they got papyrus sheets and, and, uh, and cut them into sheets and bound them together. And it was the uh, forerunner of the modern book. So it's very similar to a book. Um, I'll just go back, sorry, on that, on the codex. Um, on the, uh, the codex was almost exclusively used by Christians. So um, the codex, the sheets were written double-sided. Um, and so as soon as uh, uh, they find a double-sided um, papyrus, with text on both sides, the immediate reaction is, this is a Christian document. So, um, so that makes uh, Christian documents identifiable. Do you know why that was the case? Um, uh, the various suggestions of it. One is to kind of uh, distinguish it from Jewish, um, but I'm not really sure. Okay. Um, now, there are famous papyri collections. Um, a couple of them are going to mention the Chester Beatty and the Bodmer. Thank you. The Chester Beatty papyri. These were a group of Greek papyrus, biblical second and third century codices, so they're co codexes, codices. They were bought from an Egyptian dealer by Alfred Chester Beatty, hence their name. The um, collection was announced in 1931, and it includes the papyri P45, P46, and P47. So they have sequential numbers because they're all registered at the same time. Um, they are housed in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin and some parts are in the University of Michigan and other places. The Bodmer papyri, they were discovered in Pabao near Dishna in Egypt in 1952 
And legend has it that they were stolen from Pachymian monks who were followers of St. Pacomius. They were smuggled to uh, Switzerland and they were purchased by Martin Bodmer, uh, who died in 1971. Uh, there are 22 papyri, including P66, P72 and P75. They're all important documents. And in 2007, they were transported from Switzerland to the Va Vatican in an armed motor car, the Cade, surrounded by people with machine guns. <laughs> all right, so it gives you an idea how valuable these documents were. And they're now kept in the Vatican Library. So a bit of excitement to the talk. All right. Highly significant papyri. P52, I'm going to describe each of these in a bit more detail, um, is the earliest. P66 contains the Gospel of John. P45, Gospel and Acts. P46, Paul's letters. P P47, Revelation. And P75, Luke and John. Um, so this was the one on the first slide. The Rylands uh, is held in the Rylands Library and it's Papyrus P52. It's also called St John's Fragment. It's Papyrus Codex. It's written on both sides. Uh, so it's Christian. It was purchased in 1920 from the Egyptian market. In 1935, um, uh, a bloke called Roberts identified it and dated it about 125 AD. He distributed it to several paleographers and they all came back with the same date. It contains fragments of John 18, uh, which is Jesus' trial before Pilate. Um, so they were found in Egypt, which is a long way from where John was supposed to be written, which was supposed to be Ephesus. So the original must have been uh, written significantly early. So uh, at one stage, people would, uh, some scholars would claim that John was written late second century. And uh, this kind of made that uh, thesis a bit difficult. Papyrus 66. This is part of the Bodmer collection. It was discovered in 1952. It contains much of the Gospel of John. And it's been dated uh, between 150 and 200 AD. Uh, but you always get somebody <laughs> who tries to date it really late. And so um, a, a few scholars have tr uh, tried to date it fourth century. Um, and it admits a story about the woman caught in adultery, which is in John 8. Papyrus 45. This is written about 250 AD in Egypt, and part of Chester Beatty. Uh, the original codex would have contained 220 pages, so only 30 survived. So I only got a small fragment of it. Uh, it contains sections from the four Gospels and Acts. Um, this one is uh, very significant, Papyrus 46. It contains most of uh, Paul's letters. Now, it is Alexandrian. Alexandrian means good, <laughs> all right, because that's where the library was, and that's where the good uh, scribe practices came from. Uh, mostly dated 175 to 225 AD, others dated 150 to 175. Part of uh, Chester Beatty. Contains most of Paul's letters and Hebrews. Contains eight chapters of uh, Romans, remainder in, were in lost pages. Virtually all of 1 and 2 Corinthians, two chapters of 1 Thessalonians, all of Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians. Doesn't include the pastoral epistles which are 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. Papyrus 47, part of the Chester Beatty, uh, contained parts of the book of uh, Revelation, 3rd century. Um, this is a very important one. Papyrus 75, uh, part of the Bodmer collection, and it's uh, dated uh, 175 to 225. Uh, Philip Comfort believes it's earlier. Um, closely resembles Codex Vaticanus, which I'll talk about later. 102 to 140 pages survived and contains most of the Gospels of Luke and John. And this is um, um, an example of the professional book hand. Now I'll talk about the great unseal codices. So what does unseal mean? Unseal means rounded, sin, uh, single stroke capital letters, uh, uppercase, uh, without regular gaps between words, which makes it really easy to read. 
Um, they are complete Greek copies of the Old New Testament. And uh, they are Codex Sinaiticus, Codex uh, Vaticanus, Codex Alexandrinus, which is from the Alexandrian region, um, Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. Uh, the most significant uh, of those two of the, uh, are the first two, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. But there's some interesting stories about the others. Uh, they are written on vellum, which is high quality, by professional scribes. And they are based on the most accurate texts of their time. They have different order of books. So the canon wasn't established when these were written. So they were collections, but they're not necessarily uh, the formal collections. Codex Sinaiticus, it's an uh, Alexandrian text type. So it's written in the fourth century, discovered by Const Constantin von Tischendorf. Um, in the 19th century at St. Uh, Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Peninsula. So a lot of these books were kept in monasteries and um, the fact that they survived is uh, uh, quite miraculous from the point of view that in the monasteries the uh, priests often didn't know what they held <laughs> and they might use some of the manuscripts for burning their fires. <laughs> so it's <was> quite handy that... <laughs> Um, uh, that these texts survive. Um, it was retrieved from the rubbish. Uh, Tischendorf uh, visited, ver uh, had several visits uh, from uh, 1844. He retrieved the copy in 1859 and delivered it to Alexander II, who was Tsar of Russia. And the text was published in 1862. Of course, Russia fell to the communists. Um, the Soviet Union sold the codex to the British Museum in 1933 and the complete document is now available online. There was controversy over the acquisition process, but it is one of the most valuable resources for establishing the original text. Codex Vaticanus. This is in the Vatican Library since the 15th century, and it's also dated to the uh, 4th century, and it is one of the best texts. Um, its provenance is debated. Provenance means where and when it was uh, composed and is a leading example of the Alexandrian text type. So whenever you see Alexandrian, Alexandrian means good. Um, so it may have been brought from Constant Constantinople at the fall of the Byzantine Empire, so as they were retreating from Byzantium. Codex uh, Alexandrus, Alexandrinus, um, is held in the British Library, and it's roughly from the same era brought to Constantinople in 1621, presented to James I uh, in England in uh, 1624, provenance unknown, most probably Alexandr Alexandrina. Uh, Codex Ephraimi Rescriptus. Uh, it's probably not as high quality as the others, but it's got an interesting story behind it. It was supposedly composed by Ephraim the Syrian and on recycled uh, parchment, um, that uh, originally contained scriptural text. So they originally had um, uh, scriptural text on it and so they reused it. So they washed and rubbed out what was there before and then wrote over the top of it. So that's why it's called Rescriptus, it's written again. Uh, some bits are missing. It's mainly Alexandrian text type and was brought to Florence from Constantinople and brought to Catherine de' Medici in 1550. Now, Oxyrhynchus is a place that features very heavily in as far as ancient manuscripts are concerned. So about half of all early fragments were, have been discovered at Oxyrhynchus. It's a single town. Uh, a group of man manuscripts was discovered in the rubbish tip by uh, Grenfell, and Art, uh, uh, Grenfell and Hunt in the late 19th century. And the manuscripts are dated between 1st and 6th century. So they're not all New Testament manuscripts by any means. So it included Old Testament and New Testament manuscripts, some second century and many third century. Why did they survive? Well, one, it was a hot, dry climate that did not flood. So you didn't have problems with deterioration during, due to fungi. Um, it was, uh, a prosper, was a prosperous regional capital. The Arabs invaded it in 641 and the uh, canal system fell into 
disrepair. So the city was un, uh, untouched, abandoned, and left untouched um, until modern times. So uh, they dug up the rubbish tip and it had been undisturbed for over a thousand years. Uh, and so they were able to uh, recover a huge number of manuscripts. So um, even today, there's still uh, a, a huge amount of potential excavation, but it's underneath an existing town. So people get upset if you knock down their house. But um, what, it, what it does actually demonstrate is if there was so much in a single town, how much has been lost everywhere else? So there must have been an enormous number of documents that would have potentially survived, but they just didn't survive. Dating methods. Um, sometimes carbon dating is used, uh, but the main method that is used is paleography. So this is a study of uh, ancient handwriting. So uh, scholars examined the language, the alphabet, the characters, uh, how abbreviations were used and varied over time. Uh, they make uh, comparisons uh, between non-New Testament documents. So uh, unfortunately, the, none of the New Testament documents are dated. Um, so you can't explicitly um, or, well, and when people made copies, they didn't put in 14th of September, 73 AD on it. Um, so they, but you compare it with other do, uh, documents, say business documents that had similar styles of writing that were dated. And so that they can get hints about dating from, uh, from those comparisons. This is an example of paleographic analysis. I'm not going to read all of this, but uh, just to give uh, skim over it, and it will give you an idea of the sort of things that paleographers consider. Uh, so what they do is not trivial. Um, but I'll take you down to uh, uh, the last sentence from the word thus. So it's around about five lines up. Um, let's see. Um, thus we need to seek a more solid date for P75. So he's considering the uh, dating of P75 based uh, on comparable manuscripts with dates derived from documentary evidence. In this light, it is significant that the editors of P75 also know that the handwriting P75 is like that found in Blah, a document text about the sale of land dated specifically to AD 145-146. So they have a, a dated comparison. And it um, goes on. So I'll just uh, read the excerpt of it. Um, it says, uh, document 2452, also designated as 3036, is similar to P75. Concerning this manuscript, the editor said, the hand is a bold, slightly sloping, yet also squarish capital of fair size. The rem resemblance with P75 is unmistakable. Uh, note especially the formation of the angular alpha, epsilon, small omicron, rho, tau, upsilon, all with left curved descenders and squat omega. Does that mean much to you? Uh, and then later on he says, um, since the majority of uh, comparable man manuscripts come from the second century, I'd be inclined to date P75 to the late second century between 175 and 200 AD. So that's from uh, Comfort's book. So the, these people who study this are not mugs. <laughs> uh, often you come across the terms recto and verso. Uh, they are two different sides of the papyrus. Recto is the preferred side and is used first. Verso tends to be used 25 years afterwards. So if one side is dated explicitly, then the other side can be estimated. So that's another um, key to actually dating documents. Text types, I've mentioned these a little bit. Uh, text types um, for the early texts are uh, denoted as Alexandrian, Western and Byzantine. And it relates to the uh, different areas of um, the Roman Empire. So you can see Alexandria is in uh, Egypt, near the um, mouth of the Nile. Uh, oh, 
Western is um, in the Roman region in North Africa, and uh, Byzantium is uh, where Constantinople is, so it's where Greece meets uh, Turkey. Alexandrian text type is from the region of Alexandrian Egypt, based on scribal practices of the Alexandrian Library. So they are early well regarded texts, carefully controlled copying, basis of most modern translations. Western text type, also called Caesarean. Uh, these are also very early texts uh, from North Africa, Italy and Gaul. Gaul is another name for France. So um, they're basically uncontrolled. So Alexandrian were controlled, uh, uh, Western uh, not uncontrolled. So there's uh, more use of paraphrases and corruptions. Byzantine text type. Um, so this is um, shown in the red there in the middle. Um, also called Koine. So this is late tra uh, tradition and so this is 95% of all texts. So it has the most paraphrases and additions. And all the Reformation era translations were derived from Byzantine documents. So it is a basis of what is called the Textus Reception, uh, Receptus, which is a Greek translation basis. So this is a Greek translation which was a basis for the KJ, King James Version of the German Luther Bible. How does a number of New Testament uh, manuscripts compare with other ancient documents? There are 20,000 manuscripts prior to the printing press of the New Testament. Of these, 5,600 are in Greek, and the rest are in other languages such as Latin, uh, Latin Coptic, Syrian, Armenian, and Georgian. Uh, compare, the, most other uh, uh, manuscripts for another document is the Iliad, which has 1,757. So it is, has less than 10% the number of copies the New Testament does. Even more poorly represented are the works of uh, other famous documents, Herodotus, Thucydides, Aristotle, etc. Um, a lot of these only have around about a dozen manuscripts. So the amount of evidence that we have for the New Testament text uh, is overwhelmingly compared with others. So here's a table which uh, gives you an indication of, um, that compares the documents. Uh, so it shows um, the author of the book, the date it was written, the date of the earliest copy, the time span between the date it was written and the earliest copy, um, and the number of copies. So the um, comparison is quite stunning. So we have um, um, manuscripts which are less than 100 years from the date of authorship, and the closest other one is 500 years. Uh, and then the number of copies, there's uh, much more copies than New Testament documents. Why are there not more? <laughs> um, there's um, two reasons. One is uh, Roman destruction of the documents and the other is natural attrition. Um, in uh, 305, uh, yeah, Diocletian was Roman emperor from 284 to 305, and he uh, instituted the great persecution in the year 303. He rescinded the legal rights of all Christians uh, until his uh, persecution was ended by the Edict of Milan in 313. Uh, in that time, Christians were forced to comply with Roman religious pra uh, practices or face imprisonment or execution. He ordered the destruction of all Christian buildings and scriptures. Um, so the first sign that the persecution had started was when where churches were set on fire. Um, many um, scriptures were lost. We would have far more if it wasn't for that persecution. Um, but, uh, and so uh, some Christians gave up their documents, surrendered them to save their lives and others tried to substitute uh, apocryphal works, uh, but the Romans knew what they were looking for. Um, uh, and um, of course, many of them hid their scriptures. Now I'm going to talk about variant types. 
there are many variants. Uh, and some of these were accidental variants, some were deliberate. And so the issue is, given all these variants, can we actually recover what was originally written? First of all, talk about ac uh, type of accidental variants. Um, there are simple ones like spelling errors or mistaking a letter. Then um, this, uh, there's a, these all got technical terms for textual critics. Uh, ditography, that's a um, uh, repetition of a word or a letter or phrase. So it's the I skipping back. Um, haplography is called scribal leap. So this is an omission of a word, letter or phrase. So it's the I skipping forward, jumping to the next occurrence of a repeated word. Um, now the homoi, homo e o arcton. Um, so um, homo means like, and arcton means beginning. So a like beginning. So this is a, a omission by jumping to a similar word with the same beginning. And then the reverse is home oeo teluton. Teluton is like telos, end goal. So same end goal, so it means like ending. So it's a mission by skipping to a word with a similar ending. And then transposition, which is a reversal of two letters or two words. So when um, scholars go through documents, and they can see these variants and they can say, oh, I see how that mistake was made because they can classify the type of error. Then there's deliberate uh, variants. Um, these are, con uh, uh, first one is conflated reading. So if a, a copyist has um, two sources and they differ, scratches his head, which one's right? I don't know. I'll include both. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a deliberate variant, but there's nothing sinister about it. Um, then um, interpolation. So um, the author might uh, look at a text and think, I see what he's saying, but it's not very clear. I think I can improve on that. <laughs> uh, and so he, he did. <laughs> um, so he might uh, be doing a copy for his local church and he might be a lector, a reader at his local church and so he thinks, uh, my congregation had a bit of trouble with this last time, I think I'll make a few changes to help them along. Okay, so there's nothing sinister about that type of interpolation. We may have insertions uh, from oral and other traditions and some suspect that the uh, woman caught in adultery is uh, from the oral tradition and that um, it wasn't in John's original copy and so the story had been going around the traps and so I thought oh this is pretty good it's actually quite plausible really don't you reckon the story is quite plausible it seems in the nature it doesn't contradict anything um, and so um, people uh, put it in it's uh, in some copies has been put in the Gospel of Luke so it's not just John, it's been put into Luke as well. Um, so, yeah, so insertions from oral and other traditions. Insertions from ecclesiastical practices. So additions to reflect church practice, e.g. fasting or baptismal confessions. Um, lectoral uh, ex expansions, like to enhance the oral reading, like inclusion of amen or doxologies. Like in the Lord's Prayer, um, the last bit is not there in the originals, but it's in the King James Version, I believe. What is it? The King, the Pan. I forget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's a doxology that was inserted later. Um, narrative gap filling. Um, like an example is like uh, when Paul kind of left the synagogue, he went teaching in uh, the Hall of Tyrannus. In the Western text, it tells you what time of day he did it. All right. Um, gospel harmonizations, especially between gospels, uh, e.g. Uh, wisdom is justified by her children or her works. 
Um, harmonization with the Septuagint. This occurred uh, especially in the fourth century. Uh, theological, theological alterations by orthodox or heretics, such as Marcion. So people made changes to support their position. And Christological changes. Major variants. Um, uh, uh, major variant is the long ending in Mark, uh, chapter 16, verses 9 to, 9 to 20. The woman caught in adultery. Uh, so the early reference to this is in the 400s when it was cited by St. Augustine. Uh, Trinitarian teaching in the King James Version, 1 John 5, 7 to 8, has a Trinitarian statement. It's called the Comma uh, Johannium, but the, this only goes back to the 10th century. So uh, given the number of variants, can we actually recover the text? So the first step is to identify them and their causes. Uh, the other th is to kind of uh, understand the psychology of the scribe. Uh, so uh, un understand the scribal attitude or his agenda. Like, um, for instance, was the, uh, did the scribe have a high reverence for the word? He says, oh, this is um, sanctified text and I better not alter it. Or did he think, I can do better than this? <laughs> I mean, so if you looked at uh, Luke's prologue, uh, Luke 1, 1 to 4, uh, pretty ponderous to read, isn't it? We could do better than that, couldn't we? Clarify it. How about we do it and submit it? Uh, so uh, there are various uh, te uh, text-critical techniques to distinguish between variations. Um, the King James Version used far less resources. Um, I'm just wondering if I've, I might run the risk of repeating myself. I think I've discussed it elsewhere. Uh, but um, the Textus Receptus was uh, developed by Erasmus in uh, 1516, published by Erasmus in 1516. I think I might have repeated this later. Um, but he only used six Byzantine documents from the 10th century. But the modern versions, if you actually compare them with the King James Version, apart from the Old English, they're not all that different. Um, now we've uh, got still plenty of sc uh, scope to find more manuscripts, so they're still finding them. But um, the expectation is there won't be a lot of change because uh, it's uh, relatively stable between what we have now compared with the King James. Significant Greek additions. Uh, Textus Re uh, Receptus, I've mentioned it. So this was composed and um, published by Desiderius Erasmus in 1515. So it was just before Luther uh, posted his 95 theses on the church door. Um, it was based on five or six Byzantine texts from the 10th to 13th centuries. And it was a basis for the Reformation translation, such as King James Version and Luther's Bible. Then there's a majority text uh, that's been um, developed um, along the way. I'm not sure it's a specific document. So you decide the text, so it's just a technique, based on the majority vote. So have a majority vote and a verse and you whack that in. Uh, but this bias is uh, towards the Byzantine texts, which are less accurate. So not majority is not always right. <laughs> um, the New Testament in the original Greek by Westcott and Hort. So the first edition came out in 1891. Uh, so this favoured um, codices uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, uh, especially Vaticanus. Um, but it's still highly regarded. Now, and um, what is commonly used now is Novum um, Testament, Test Testamentum Graecae. It's basically called Nestle Allen and Text. Uh, so this is the basis of most modern translation. It re relies more on earlier Alexandrian texts. First edition was in 1898 uh, and uh, the current edition is the 28th. So it's still under development. Access to New Testament manuscripts. You can see it all yourself for free. <laughs> uh, there's a, um, 
a website uh, created by the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, and there's its web address. And it's a database of images of the Greek New Testament manuscripts that is accessible to all. Um, conclusion. Um, it is wrong to exaggerate the reliability or unreliability. If you exaggerate either way, you're not doing yourself justice or anybody else. Um, in comparison with other, but in comparison with other ancient documents, we have far more manuscripts that are much closer to the time of writing. The text is far more secure. There are disagreements among scholars, um, such as manuscript dating and the selection of variants. The content of the original autographs is not known with absolute certainty, but they are known with a high level of confidence. It's not, it's not absolutely certain, but it's jolly close. Um, there are, do remain some ambiguities, but they're very minor in their implications. Um, so, when you actually read it, you can have a high level of confidence that you're reading pretty well uh, what the uh, uh, original author said. Do you want absolute set, uh, certainty? You're probably out of luck. Um, but it's a, a pretty good replication. It's good enough for you. Another issue is, is what the New Testament saying true? Well, that's completely another question. <laughs> Well, folks, just while the last few are gathering, um, I think we should thank Kevin for uh, a good start to the 2019. Um, I was going to ask him how about the how did we know the dates? Because the first third of the slide would pick a date for each of the um, uh, different P series of documents uh, that we had, and then of course he then did explain that by the comparison of the text and so on. So that was a question I can no longer ask. Does anyone else have questions they might like to put well, together? Relating to that one, mm. you were saying that it's often dated by getting another document that does have a date on it so that you can compare. Mm. So did they have something like uh, October 22nd, AD 34? Or oh, like they that? might identify to a, a political event, like one of them, uh, yes. they identified it as 145, 146 AD, uh, because it was uh, mentioned, might have mentioned a particular event. Um, might say the third year of somebody's reign or something like that. But you get commercial documents. You know, like a grocery yeah. list or something. The, the king sent it. Mm. <coughs> um, I did notice, and I, I hope I'm not being pedantic here, Kevin. What, I think it was the Alexandrian documents you said went to Constantinople about 1640. Not all of them. No, but some, some of them got to 1640, mm. and I thought. But that was after the um, yes, uh, Muslim conquest. Yeah, yeah, so I presume Constantinople was still still had a venue for the Orthodox Church, and that was why it was sent then. Is that right? I don't know. Mm -hmm. okay. I can answer that a bit. I, I read a, I was reading a book by um, called The Ghost Empire, yes. and um, after Constantinople fell, well, that was um, the, uh, unpopulated for a while. Mm -hmm. And then the, um, uh, what have The Ottomans. The Ottomans, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, brought back all, all the, um, the mix of people. So they brought back Christians, um, Jews, and, and Muslims and populated the city. Ah, okay. So he restored the, the well, he didn't restore it, but he, he, he kept the, the balance there. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know why he did it, but he did. Because it. So there, therefore, there would have been that. Um, history and culture going on. Exactly, because yeah. we heard that some of the Constantinople documents were, were rescued from Constantinople at the time of the Muslim invasion. Yeah. Mm. But then later, um, obviously, as we said, right. um, Rob, the, it was uh, it was established. Yeah. In fact, I think even today we have uh, the Orthodox um, I, I mean, metropolitan. Uh, yeah, well, we've learned that the patriarch you know, still rules from there, doesn't he? Yeah, um, I think the, the, the Greek Orthodox Church. Yes. No, it's not, not in Russia as of this week. <laughs> no, but, <laughs> but um, by that I mean the, um, the five that we were there last year, what we learned about the five mm -hmm. missions. Well, they, uh, when we went on a tour of Turkey, um, right. they bragged how tolerant they were, but 99% of the population is Muslim. Mm. <clears throat>
So it must be a better religion. Well, it, I watched a, there's a YouTube doc really, documentary, it's about oh, four or five hours long, it's the history of Islam. And that would correlate with what you're mm. saying, but from the other, from the other mm. side, from the Islamic side, mm. um, that they actually, um, they, they talked about how well uh, the Muslims actually treated the, the Christians. Mm. And um, I mean, some Christian documentation that's not very conflicting with that either. Mm. So, mm. But they had a lot of mood changes with government changes. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they really wanted to be able to tax their new empire. The, uh, <coughs> the Muslims expanded so rapidly that they had to befriend uh, lots of Christian uh, states and cities as well as Jewish ones. And, and they sort of, it, it varied over the years, mm -hmm. somehow. But there aren't many Christians left in Muslim countries. Well, after mm -hmm. 1915, the Armenian genocide, um, things got pretty tough there. Look, I'm sorry, we're probably getting right on topic. Yeah, I was thinking, man. We are getting right on topic. <laughs> just because yeah. while we're talking about Islam and things related, I was just, it came to my mind while you were talking, was wondering whether or not there are autographs or, and original archetypes for the Quran. Um, I'm not strong on this. No, they're all burnt. Um, under the orders of the, I think, the first caliph after Muhammad. Um, because they had variants all over the place and they had got the point of view that this is ridiculous, we've got to get a definitive proper Quran. So that was all called in. Uh, they got the scholars to put together what they believed was the authentic Quran and everything else was burnt. Mm. So, yeah, but, uh, I should imagine uh, the ancestry of that document would be pretty good. Uh, so it's, uh, I expect there'd be heaps of manuscripts. Of, yeah, uh, that's not. Um, I haven't looked into Muslim manuscripts, but I, I expect that they would be um, a huge number of Muslim uh, manuscripts as well. Um, but with that limitation, that and it is also more recent. Yes. yes. Mm. Okay. Just a, a small comment on my own. It's not so much a query as I. It actually goes back to the. Um, what Eusebius said when I gave a presentation last year, it was tradition of the um, Jewish people to know their family history so they could trace their lineage back to, well, King David or Abraham or whatever. So we get both in Matthew and Luke um, an old oral tradition that is no doubt reported, albeit slightly differently between the two. So mm. I, I suspect that both Matthew and or Luke, and both actually, were in fact in that case copying an oral tradition that the uh, fam Jesus' family had passed on, because that's in fact what Eusebius said. Uh, that's what yeah, Eusebius um, um, had an explanation of how come the two... Uh, were different. He did. Different. Yes, that's right. That's the level you of presented that. Yes, that's right. But more particularly, <laughs> um, you made the point that at least part of the thing is the oral tradition. And when you were saying that, I thought, ah, yes, that makes sense, because we do know that a Jew, to prove he was a Jew should know his family lineage way back. So that's why both Luke would have got it, and indeed mm. Matthew would have got it from Jesus' mm. family, mm. Uh, Mary or, or um, all the brothers. Mm. Just, just a quick point on that. Um, the, there's a terrific amount of evidence that the Matthew particularly was originally written in Hebrew, yes. and that that shows that the genealogy shown there is actually the genealogy of Mary uh, and it talks about the, f the, uh, the father of um, the father-in-law of Jesus that that last group of 14 that refers to you know it says there's, there's lots of 14 well, the last one's only 13 if you read the English language versions but the problem is that instead of Joseph being the, the mother of uh, sorry being the husband of, of Mary it um, it means the father of Mary. So Joseph was certainly the husband as well, but there was also a Joseph who was the father of Mary. So if you, if you no. change that, well, it all makes perfect sense. And the, the one in Luke is to do with the genealogy of, um, of Joseph. So yeah. that's the reason. Eusebius, who was only 300 yards apart, 300 years apart from the event, actually makes a different explanation. He makes the point 
that I think two or three generations earlier, one of the descent came down from Nathan, son of Solomon. Yeah, I've read that. The other one came down from uh, yeah. yes, Luke. One from Nathan and one from Solomon. And it was one, they, the, the two lines intersected about at the grandfather level. Yeah. One of the brothers yes, died, yes. and then the other brother, who was well, stepbrother, who was from the other line, then married yeah. his widow, and so the two actually combined uh, at about I think it was the grandfather level. Okay. Well, that was pretty simple. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, sorry, we won't go into yeah, detail. Yeah, yeah. Back to the um, the writing of the. Uh, in the evidence we have for the New Testament, um, obviously the number of copies, what, 2,200 was it? The 2,200? Um, 20,000. 20,000. 20, 20, you made an interesting point that 5,000 of them were Greek, which means another 15,000 were the other languages you mentioned. Yeah. And you mentioned Syrian, which presumably is Aramaic. Be interesting to know how many were Aramaic, because the early church, there were a lot more Aramaic speakers than, uh, than Greek speakers in just in the first 50, 100 years. Um, and the, there's something that came out, which I've talked talk to uh, Kevin about before, called the Peshitta early last century, uh, about 2019 uh, or whatever, which was thought to be a big deal at the time about how the early writings were probably in Aramaic translated into Greeks. It's not proven totally either way, but <laughs> did you ever look into that at all, the Aramaic side of it? Not really, no. No, okay. Mm. I know it's debated. An, an interesting point in all this is that uh, you have a group in the church who uh, believe that the Textus Receptus is the Word of God, mm. and the King James Bible is the uh, King James Version is the Word of God, mm. and so there's uh, some people who are uh, quite. You, you're laughing. You. you... No, John was just bringing this up as we were talking. Right. About okay. Jesus, right. Well, um, <laughs> the basis of it is uh, how could God leave us in the dark for 400 years? So the Textus. Receptus must be it. So it's not kind of... <clears throat> and so they reject the Alexandrian <clears throat> evidence. All right, have I, I got this right? Yeah. Um, yeah look, I've run into many people that believe the King James Version is the word of God, mm -hmm. and that's infallible. Yeah. Um, yeah. If it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. I don't hold that position myself. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I don't hold that position myself, yeah. but, but many people do. Uh, look, I, I think the... We were talking about the uh, Anglican theology... Uh, of the uh, prayer book in the 39 articles uh, thought of that the the scriptures as received from King James which is what they had were an infallible guide to God's truth and justice and, uh, and the right way to live but they didn't think the text was infallible mm. see, see, but if you listen to N.T. Wright he says don't go to Bible to get a reference on morality. That's not its purpose or goal, which is almost and being the former Archbishop of Durham, yes. it's sort of that sort of somewhat well, seems they, to contradict. They, they didn't always stick with the 39 articles. Okay. <laughs> but that was, that was the peak of the reformed Anglican church uh, and they were just saying that they believed that, there's, that God did not leave us alone in the dark you have the light list, and if you follow that, you'll get there. Sure. May I ask then, we talked about the King James Version. Now, the Catholic Version was, what was it? Who was the writer who sat in uh, near Bethlehem and wrote Jerome. it? Jerome. Jerome, that's it, Jerome. What did he base his New Testament on? Do we know? I read about it, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I gather he, he tried to consult the best text he could at the time. Yeah. And go to uh, I mean, shot. they had copies of the Septuagint, which mm. they used for the Old Testament, mm. and uh, they were they, they were never stupid. Mm. Uh, they tried really. They acted like Christians, you know, the, the people that were collecting the boss. Yeah. That they, they had God in heaven. Jesus was His Son and their Lord and Savior, and, and they were headed down that path. It's mm. done with the best intention, the best will, yeah. and mm. in prayer. It's prayer as much as I can. Yeah. Uh, and we were just having a little chat about the, the group of monks that couldn't write prayer without adding and fasting. Mm. Uh, and, and that's uh, generally proven to be an addition that in, in many cases in the New Testament. They just slip them in together. Uh, 
but that's just a textual thing, and it's quite clear if you go back to the earliest copies that when it came in. <coughs> and it was a ex theological explanation for mm. how do you pray, well, it's helpful if you fast. But it's not in the text as bold as that. So, but th that's probably the only theological problem you've got from the textual stuff, and a couple of Trinitarian jumps. Uh, to just smarten things up a bit. But it's very often defined by, um, you can always find Jesus and the Spirit, the Father, and the Spirit, the Father, and Jesus, uh, the Father, and the Spirit. You can always sort of, it's, it's all, yeah, but some people just underline mm -hmm. the songs so much. Mm -hmm. uh, with, we've always thought of them as over pious monks doing their little textual mm -hmm. copying. I've uh, heard somebody challenge the Great Commission, baptising in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. I don't think you, that's, that's a very hard one to challenge, I think, because mm. that's what they did. Mm. <laughs> well, I was going to raise that as well. That, that, um, the, there's one of the great uh, writers in the third century referred to that verse in Matthew 28, um, verses 18 and 19, um, and, and uh, I'll just read quickly. Um, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing, and then baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, teaching them uh, to observe all things, and so on. Those words were probably added in the second or even the fourth century. Um, but there's, uh, just can't think of the guy's name who was a well known early church writer who 18 times referred to that verse in his various writings over the over the decades, uh, and quoted that verse without those words in it. So certainly, just trying to think of the name of the guy. Um, so that one is really sus, and the point there, I think, is that the other scripture you referred to, I think it's First John chapter 5, where it talks about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, the Trinity, which we know the words, in, not in the Bible, and there it's talking about the witness, uh, one of the ways that the witness is because of, of that, but that was, that was added that, uh, as well. You referred to that up there then. And the point being that the early Catholic Church uh, was trying to lock in on this concept of um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were three sort of persons of the Godhead, whereas the Holy Spirit is probably more in the nature of, in wherever it's referred to, it's more the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus, and um, it has... Um, you know, it does have its own independent thought in various ways, so we can't really get our heads around it, but it's not a person in the way that God the Father, spiritual person, the way that God the Father and God the Son are. And the reason that's important is because, as you say, it talks about getting baptised in that name, wherever else it, it talks about getting baptised in the name of Jesus, like in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. Uh, and it's pretty important, you know, to get baptised in the right name. So... I've been baptised again in the name of Yeshua in my case, but um, because I think that's a really serious error. They probably didn't think so much about it at the time, but that's, that's flowed from those early centuries. I haven't quite made it a lifetime study of it, but I always got the impression that the Aramanic texts were a bit late and they had low Christology and they were part of the Aryan, Aryan heresy. So, I mean, I know you're basing a lot of your thoughts around it, and I'm coming at it from a, uh, a whole lot of different presuppositions about uh, the Aramaic sort of uh, her heretical documents that are late, and and you're saying they're early, so we, there's, a, there's a mile apart in, but there's two ways of the early Hebrew scriptures, there's two ways of coming at this, and uh, I've always been a bit uncomfortable with yours, and no doubt you're a bit uncomfortable. Yeah, okay. yeah. Another, uh, when I actually going through it, um, in P75, which is a very early yeah. and supposedly reliable text, it omits um, Jesus' statement on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Mm. Which is interesting. Because that verse always disturbed me. Because mm. some of the things I do wrong, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Does that... Does it, does it mean I don't get forgiveness because I do <laughs> have sin deliberately? Um, 
but it's a um, yeah, it's uh, not in the earliest manuscript. Uh, not the earliest ones that we've got anyway. Yeah. yeah. What about the woman taking the doctor? When did that get introduced? Well, uh, from what um, I, I had, uh, like Saint Augustine mentions. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about four hundred. So yeah, that's apparently fits it. It's apparently a nice codex page, okay. and that they've got the page. They reckon Jesus did something like that, and they've been shuffling around trying to find a spot in the Bible to shove it into. Yeah. Uh, and they never have page numbers or chapter headings. Oh, okay. So you've just got this bit of text, and people think, "Yeah, Jesus might have done that." This is this is the sort of thing he would character. do. Yeah. Hmm. I've got something here, I'd like to read this off if I may, about a woman caught in adultery that it seems, anyway, if I could just read this. Um, most Christian scholars are honest enough to acknowledge that John did not write this. Um, why would someone insert this story into the book of John? Uh, it's a proof text for Christians to prove that Jesus forgives adultery with no consequences to the offender. Uh, go and sin no more is all, all her punishment is sort of thing. Uh, her sin without consequences. Um, but then, you know, the whole story is just doesn't stack up with, with the Old Testament. Bringing an accused person publicly uh, with no co-accused co is pretty serious error. No husband or credible witnesses, and we have no idea whether or not those making the charges were even the ones caught, who caught her in the act. Um, reader automatically feels sorry for the victimised woman. It's impossible that the woman be judged because the basic criteria are entirely non-existent. Torah requires that both parties involved in the adultery be put up the charges together and in the presence of their accusers as well as with uh, any witnesses and elders of the community, none of which was done here. Um, it talks about Moses commanded that uh, each should be stoned, uh, that each such shall be stoned. But that's not, it is not supported by Torah or rabbinical okay, under any such circumstances. Um, the hands of the witnesses uh, shall be first upon him uh, to put him to death. So the witnesses have to throw the vote to him. You can't just offer it to anybody. Um, the author makes a serious religious uh, statement, political statement, that juxtaposes his Jesus hero against the Pharisees. It's, it's anti-Semitic in, in its context to a large degree, you know. The Pharisees are pictured as picking up stones in a fit of rage to kill him and not condemning the poor adulterous woman. Christians have been taught to view the Pharisees as half-hearted, legalistic stone throwers. Christian history shows that the Pharisees are a Sunday picnic compared to the pogroms and massacres of Jews and so on. Um, it's only a little bit more. Um, this is a sharp contrast to the account of Ananias and Sapphira, where, of course, they were some, uh, yes. uh, the woman caught in adultery, suffered no ill consequence, uh, any, no consequences. Christians theorise that, that she is saved, which also makes them feel better about their adultery in their own churches. No consequences from many Christian circles for adultery, which is why then pastors, priests, and reverends commit adultery and other sex crimes and so on that can be continued right along with their ministries as if hardly anything's happened and so on. The story crept into the text a couple of hundred years after John, therefore it's shameful to suggest that it was one of John's disciples that added it, which is when I find that. Eric, I can't, I can't comment on the biblical sources and stuff, but the first part of that you read out was an argument from silence. Argument what? It was an argument from silence. So basically, because we're not told the witnesses were there, because we're, and we're told that she was caught in the act, because we're not told the witnesses were actually waiting to be the first Doesn't mean they weren't. to mm. throw the first stone, mm. the first half that you read out was an argument for silence. So we actually don't know. No, but it's pretty obvious that it's just an anti-Semitic thing oh, that no, makes no, it. No, 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 the argument for silence. Oh, that, 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 that argument from silence calls into question the rest of it. I think the, 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 uh, the juxtaposition, I take, take that last bit, about Sophia, uh, the, the two who didn't declare all their land. No, it's fine. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. But I'm just pointing out the first bit that you read. Yeah. We don't know any of that. 
No, mm. it, it's right. You could argue both ways. Well, but, and you know, I have, you know, personally, I've never interpreted it in an anti-Semitic way. Yeah. So the, the kind of the theme that comes um, to me is um, he was, um, don't <laughs> accuse others when you've got problems of your own. That's, that, that's the thing. Yeah, and I'm sorry, if anyone's around. seen the movie How Green Was My Valley, sorry, the, yeah. the boot is very much against Christians who are saying just as bad as those Pharisees. So believe mm. me, Christian uh, Christians can be shown in exactly the same light and were in that particular movie. Mm. There was a lady who, who wanted a role for the minister and they really shouted her for that. But that's, uh, no, look, I, I don't see that sense to me. And can I say, it says, go and sin no more. So the, mm. the whole, that whole small account calls it a sin. Jesus doesn't forgive Oh, sure, but there's no, no consequences. Mm. Yeah. Oh, so yeah, I, yeah, I don't see it as condoning oh, adul no, adultery. Not. It's called a sin. I think yeah. Dennis raises a good point, though, which mm. is one that really... There's a number of things that, that trouble me with my world that I continually wrestle with in my faith. Why do we have so many interpretations? Why do we have so many? Why is it so unclear? Like, um, you know, even the, the arguments we have about the, the texts and then the, the number of versions, uh, etc. Why, if it's really true, who do you expect a God who wanted to communicate with his people across ages? Isn't it a good question to ask? Why well, isn't it clearer? Why are there so many questions? I reckon it teach you to grow up. No, um, I, th I think it's just a reflection that life is more complicated and, he's not, and you're not going to get all the answers. Mm. And just, it's up to you to, to do that. And, and so it, it then speaks to different generations because it's not, it's not just laying down, you shall do this. There's some people who like to do that. I'm, yeah. um, I, there was an article I read in The Age, I think, of this woman who was a, a non-Christian atheist and she read the Bible and she likes it because it doesn't, it's got all the faults and mm. it, all the philosophies, you know, it, it talks, you know, mm. some, some of Solomon's, it, it's got everything about life in it. So she, she, she was looking at it from the point of view it's of, not a simple rule, of the ideas mm. rather than the word for word mm. and, and the fact that it reflects our whole life and, and we, we mm. certainly make sense of it. Like Paul says, now we yeah. see in a mirror dimly. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I get all that. And I asked, I actually had the chance yeah. to ask N.T. Wright. I was lucky enough to be in a forum that he was yeah. talking about. And he actually took my question with sort of textured questions in and he turned around and he said, well, how can we agree about like 97% of it? Okay, that doesn't help. <laughs> it does a bit. I mean, the fact is, I totally believe that the original was the word of God. But the fact is we've gone 2,000 years. We've probably gone four languages, you know, Hebrew, Aramaic. Uh, Greek into English then, uh, different cultures, different la language changes over time. Uh, there's all these reasons and, and what we've got is remarkably accurate but there's bound to be the layers creep in for all those reasons. Yes. Oh, just just about one word of comfort to finish right. with perhaps. I expect to see Ananias and Sapphira in heaven. Yes. Because if they don't make it, we're all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> they actually sold their farms and stuff here. They did do get part of it. Mm. Yes. About that woman, since we're off topic, um, if you read through the book of John, you notice most of the stories in John's Gospel are followed up by a hunk of teaching for which the story that started is either an illustration of the teaching or an introduction to the teaching. This particular story of the woman uh, is followed up by some teaching thereafter. And the story of the woman prepares for the teaching that comes afterwards. It's about witnesses and Jesus saying that they're the Father and I've got multiple witnesses for me for who I am. The story right. of this okay. woman, uh, she is brought to Jesus, presumably by those who caught her in adultery. And one also assumes that Jesus had the same question that we always have, uh, how if they only catch one person in the other adultery. Uh, and so he is... They have made him the judge in this case. They said, we're the witnesses, we've caught her. You're the judge, now pass sentence. This is what Moses says. It's your job. And so Jesus effectively said, yes, you're right. She deserves to die. Um, but because he was having a go at the Pharisees rather than the woman uh, for trying to do it this way and to get him in trouble and for only bringing one person caught in adultery, uh, he goes, provides it, okay, that he who is without sin cast the first stone. Those were the witnesses. And these witnesses all disappeared. So that therefore left no witnesses 
against this woman. So therefore, according to the law, Jesus as the judge was then legally bound to acquit her. So he was not going against the law, he was upholding the law as they knew it, um, and agreeing that yes, she'd done it, but no witnesses, she must be acquitted. Uh, but he still acknowledged that she had sinned and told her to go and sin no more. Jesus okay. also came from the perspective of grace. Yes. Mm. And he had the authority to forgive. Um, whereas you have to take that story a bit further and look at James. If you continue in sin, yes. you are none of his. So go and sin no more. So that brought her into alignment in relationship with Jesus at that time to be one of his and thinking along his theological perspective by, well, we don't know, sinning no more mm -hmm. so well, about that particular sin. So, so when did we stop stoning women for adultery? Because it, it was mainly the women who were stoned. Oh, oh, no. That's, that's my perspective on it. That because it, you had so many witnesses against the woman reading some of the old laws, it's definitely... The woman had more chance of being stoned than the man. The How do you know that? Yeah, that's right. So I mean, it's a nice story. It does have a couple but, but, of yeah, so, messages stop, for it, but it's also got some you know, know, gigantic flaws as far as the Torah is concerned. It's a bit like Father Christmas. It's quite a nice story, but it's rubbish. No. But, but when do we stop ignoring the Old Testament? What's your basis for what's your basis for saying that more women were stoned than men? I'm reading the the laws, and you'll find that the women had more less chance of, um, of, of making it away. That the two men, the men could actually accuse her. If you read, if you read some of them. So Does she, that make she couldn't sense, accuse yeah? him. Yeah, look, I think on balance. Yes, yeah, she couldn't accuse her husband. It's it's, mm. it's her that's caught in the act, not mm. him. The extra New Testament evidence is that the women got the stone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. the men didn't. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, you so, go to some of the Islamic so, but, today. Yeah, 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 exactly right. So, listen, it, what I'm trying to say is when did, when did we decide not to stone for men or women? Can we stop? Choose to ignore it. I don't, are there any accounts at all in the Old Testament of, um, of execution? I'm sure they did. Up I'm sure that the Jews. Is anything the, um, in the Old Testament that they did? The Jewish culture was still stoning people. Sorry? They usually got the sword. Yeah, we assume it were there. The only record that I'm aware of of someone specifically being stoned uh, was Achan and his family after he took stuff out of Jericho in the time of Joshua. Yeah. And so, so the Jews, well, yeah. the, the Jews yeah. had stopped doing that thing. That's what I'm interpreting too. I think with Athalia, that woman who killed um, some of the family and ruled for a while, and then they had one of her, one of the son, or she was the grandmother, one of the grand. Sons was sort of uh, finally revealed and she came out and they stoned her, I think you'll find, uh, and killed her that, you know, she had been the queen. and, and oh, the queen. Jezebel. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Hathalia. Yeah, no. She was... Uh, so, so, so somehow it's... Hathalia. 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 Because they didn't have the authority to execute people, the Romans did. So, they, but they still did it. I think there were times when they didn't, times when they didn't. Yeah. So, when Jesus was executed, that was one of the times they did not have the authority to do that. Mm. So they had to get the Romans to do it. Yeah, but when they stoned Stephen, they just got mad. That, that was a slightly later period where they had a bit more control. Yeah. Mm. So, well, look, folks. Um, I think we've had a good discussion tonight. Um, obviously, some divergent yeah. topics have come up. Uh, not a bad way to start 2019, just to put out there the things that are, are related uh, in some way to what Kevin uh, led us through tonight. Um, I think we should uh, give Kevin a round of uh, applause for starting off the year. Thank you.